Alicia Baldwin, Esquire. And she's going to talk, tell us about closing papers, right? Yeah, Everything about, oh, title insurance. We all love title insurance. <laughs> Chris Ball. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ooh. I got two lights at me. I got that light, I got the sunlight. So if I move around a little bit, it's not because. It's a bad thing. I'm just trying to get my sun, um, the sun out of my eyes or, or the light out of my eyes. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to come and speak um, for your group. I met a lot of you, and it was a pleasure meeting you, getting to know what you do, getting to know what your passions are. And I love the, the inspirational uh, quotes on the wall. I just love those because we need those in our life every day with everything we do. I used to do that every day to the staff that I worked with, and they kind of said, you got to stop doing that. <laughs> you got to stop doing that once a week, once a week. I'm like, oh, come on. But they, they're they very inspirational. They mean a lot, and they have to get motivated sometimes when they're not having too good of a day. So with further ado, let me tell you a little bit about me and my company. Um, I am a closing attorney. And I've been one for quite some time, been in the business for 26 years. I had to think about that the other day. I said, my, 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 26 years. I've seen the good, bad, and the ugly. I've worked processing from beginning to end. I used to answer the phone, set up the file, make copies. Then I was, I was going to law school. Then I got to managing and processing and closing. And then you're doing the commitments and insurance and searching and policy, all, everything. And um, I also worked as a underwriting counsel for a large underwriter, a title insurance underwriter, and also claims counsel. So I've seen the beginning to help people to get through a problem and hopefully no claim, all the way from where people had to file a claim because there was an issue that wasn't taken care of or sometimes things just happen. Um, I love this business. I have, as uh, they call, it's not ice in my veins. I have dirt in my veins. I'm that good old dirt lawyer is what I like to call myself. I borrowed that from a, from an underwriter friend of mine. And my and I was doing real estate even before I was born. My mother who was a register of deeds, 24 years in our small town. And my grandfather was a register of deeds 16 years before her. So the natural progression was everybody thought I was going to run for office. They thought I was going to be the next registered deeds. And I said, no, 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 no. Being a PK is enough for me. Politicians kid. There is no way that I'm going to set foot that myself. But I found out I had a passion for it. I had a passion. I helped my mom register deeds in the office. I helped her file UCC, green belt applications, uh, deed to trust, all kinds of things. And I found out all the way that God was preparing me day by day he knew what I was, I was going to do with the rest of my life. And I found out after I yielded to that, I said, okay, I'm yielding. I found that I love it. I found out that this is my passion and I love it. So I'm an attorney. I can poke fun at my own kind. So let's liven up this group a little bit. How about it? All right, all right. All right. I'm going to ask questions if you can answer it. What is the difference between a good lawyer and a great lawyer? And so, <laughs> well, a good lawyer knows the law. A great lawyer knows the judge. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, what's the one thing that never works when it's fixed? A jury. <laughs> what's the difference between a jellyfish and a lawyer? It's my favorite one. Is gone. <laughs> one is a spineless, poisonous blob, oh. and the other one is a form of sea life. <laughs> you don't have one. That, how many attorneys does it take? You know. Oh well, yeah. At the bottom of the ocean, there's not enough. Yeah, there's not enough. There's not enough concrete on their feet. Yeah, <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about title insurance. I have some handouts here. I'd like to pass out here. I see. So I hope I think I have it. Title insurance. 
I found the best way to remember what the title is, is, is exactly the letters in its name, T-I-T-L-E. It's telling an interesting tale about land and its things. That's what a title does. It tells you the status of a title. It tells you what who owns it, what mortgages are on there. It gives you a chain of the title because what we do is we do a 30-year search for residential, 40-year plus for commercial. Now, in the beginning, just to understand the basics of everything, why title insurance? Well, it's simple. It helps to protect one of the most, if not the largest, investments that you or your client will ever make. You only pay for it one time. You know, you have a lot of car insurance, you have a lot of homeowners insurance, and they're every year or every six months, however you have them set up. Title insurance is one time, and you only pay for it one time for an owner's policy to protect yourself. It will protect you as long as you own the property, even for decades. And in some instances, it will protect you even beyond that if you convey the property by warranty deed. Okay? Kind of follows you. As long as there's not a quick claim deed involved, a quick claim deed, the best way to say a quick claim deed, you give me whatever it is. Whatever I have is yours. No warranties, no guarantees, no assurances. The quick claim deed, in some cases, is very useful. But in most cases, I don't like it. Because they don't say you don't stand, that person doesn't stand behind what they own. They don't say how I'll forever defend and warrant what I am giving, I'm conveying over to you. So, with that, title insurance steps in. The uh, best way to understand that, and people go, well, I don't understand. If I'm paying for car insurance and homeowners insurance, why am I paying that premium every month? Why can't I just pay it one time? You have to think about what you're protecting. When you own a property, we do a chain of title and a research for 30, 40, however many years based on the type of property that it is. And we say, okay, from this far back, from here, the past, we know what's there. You can't change the past. Here are the facts. Here's who's owned it. Here's the chain of title. Joe sold it to Sue. Sue sold it to this one. Joe had a lien. It was released. Sue had a loan and had a mortgage and it was released. You know the past. The problem with car insurance or homeowners insurance is the future. You don't know if tomorrow you have a car accident. You don't know tomorrow if your home might catch on fire and you have a flood problem or whatever the problem may be. That's for the future. That's why those are repeat insurance premiums. That's why title insurance is not. And you say, well, wait a minute, if you search the title and you know what's on there, then why do I need it? Let's just say I'm an attorney. I search title. I would always purchase title insurance because you never know, for example, if the register, as innocent as this may be, my mother was a register a long time ago, if they misindex a link. They misspell Smith without the E. They misspell Green with an E and it wasn't. There's different things, no matter how perfect we try to create the environment of title, no matter how much we search, digging for a lien that's there, trying to make sure there's no judgments, trying to make sure that everything's clean and proper and everybody's accounted for that's ever owned that property and signed off on it. There's gonna be something, it's human error. And you're going to have a claim. And if you have that claim without a title insurance policy, you're defending it on your own. A title insurance policy, the underwriting, uh, like this one here, I've, I've got it up here, North American Title Insurance Company, and that one is Fidelity. I've got some more handouts here. They stand behind you. They protect you. They sit in your shoes. They stand in your shoes. And they protect you. In case you get sued or you have to sue, somebody knocks on your door and said, my long lost Aunt Bertha left me this in her wheel. Uh oh, that's not good. What if there's no lien on the property? Somebody didn't really fully pay off and that lender starts the foreclosure process. You think a typical homeowner is going to have a wherewithal and the funds to fight that? Probably not. 
That's where this insurance policy steps in and takes charge and says, I got you. There's some things that insurance insurance just doesn't cover. Like if you have a restricted covenant that you can't have a pink polka dotted mailbox or a camouflage mailbox, they're gonna go both ways, girls and boys. <laughs> and you still do it? And you say, oh, I got a title claim. That's not a title insurance. There's some things that it will protect and there's some things that it won't. Now, we have two different types of insurance policies. We have an owner's policy, so it's a to protects the owner, the buyer, the new purchaser. Then we have a lender's policy. It protects the lender. Nine, nine, nine out of 10 times, a lender is gonna say, I require a title insurance policy. Every time. So wait a minute, I think the guy buying it, I think he had a loan, a conventional loan. I, I think he did, but why do I have to do it? Because that lender, and that's on his brochures, it's on here, why lenders require title insurance to protect themselves is because you can't change the insurer. That policy, that lender's policy protects that lender. That owner's policy protects that owner. And a lot of people say, well, if, if your lender gets a lender's policy, you don't need an owner's policy. You just open yourself up to liability to guarantee their title for how long? Forever. Forever. Right. Well, a long time, yeah. Not as long as you don't. That's right. So if you did, as, as somebody helping and assisting buyers and sellers, and this has come up in other states, I don't know if it's happened here, and an agent was responsible because they said you don't need it. Oh. And it's so small on the owner's side. It's so right. small. How do you calculate it? We said, well, how much is this title insurance? The owner's policy is based on the purchase price. It's a filed rate for the state of Tennessee, and it's based on the purchase price. A lender's policy, based on the loan amount. That's the coverage. The lender's going to require that you have them protected for that loan amount. And if you do a what we call a simultaneous issue, then you get a break. You get a simultaneous issue where two policies are issued at one time at a purchase, and for a little bit more, the lender's going to require it anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So for a little bit more, the owner is protected for a little bit more of a premium. So you don't have a big chunk and a big chunk. If you do it at, tw at one time, it's a simultaneous issue, and it's just a little bit more of the owner is protected. So that's how we calculate that. And there are some states that don't have filed rates. Tennessee is a filed rate state. And let me tell you, I've had this question several times. Well, on this count. I'm not paying that kind of money for that title insurance policy. It's illegal to discount the title insurance premium. Can't do it. Now, the funny thing is, I've been doing this a long time, we used to make fun of the fact there's nothing in the statute and regulations that says you go and charge this thing. <laughs> Nobody's gonna do that and, and how competitive this, this arena is, this industry is. But you can't discount it. It's against the rules, against regulations, it's against the law. And the title company, or a title attorney or closing attorney says they can, they're in throw. They can really get into a lot of legal issues. Does legal that issues. include a reissue credit? No. Okay. No, no, no. Reissue credit. Now, I've, I've read my mind. I'm sorry. <laughs> the other benefit, we'll go ahead and cover this now. The other benefit of this is title insurance. If, if you have a policy, and let's just say you want to sell the property, you get a break. If you provide a title insurance policy to your buyer and you sell it, or if they buy it, you want to give it to them, it's up to 30% savings because you've already insured it once. That goes up to 10 years. Anything over 10 years, I don't know why the magical year is a 10 year limit, but after 10 years, there's no reissue credit. Every underwriter is the same way. But up to 10 years, you get about a 30% discount. If you can provide a copy, of that policy. Now, now I know our office, we call around a lot of times and people say, oh, I can't find it, I misplaced it. Oh, me, it was on the email, it's in my packet. I'm packed up, can't find it. Do you happen to remember who you closed with? We usually give them a call and they're usually cooperative 
And if the only thing they usually require, if anything, is an authorization allowing us to call them and get it on behalf of our client. But it's a cost saving. And if there's a title issue, had one about a month ago, <coughs> old lien was never released. Two title companies that had closed on it, I guess I think it's the last five or six years, missed it. I don't know if they just didn't catch the lien and didn't do that or if they thought it was released, but it was never released. Title company at the time said, you're right, you're right. It's not released. The owner provided the title insurance policy. Of course, they got a cost savings. But it also helped us to insure and close because they could stand behind that title insurance policy because they were identified. Okay, we missed it, and it's not we didn't we didn't take care of this, but a policy was issued, so we will let you close and insure on this new one because of the it's called an identification treaty amongst the underwriters. Okay, so that's how you can cure title a lot of times with title issues is using a previous policy not only to save money, but to help with curative problems with, with title insurance. I'm going to start my clock. I'm going to start my clock. You need to wait at me if I go over. Oh, okay. <laughs> is the reason that will happen is because the people that missed it are going to pay eventually if there was a... If there's a claim, yes, yeah, they will have to stand behind that policy that was issued. That's exactly right. Okay. Now, so a new policy that would be the same company, though, didn't it? No. 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 That's why there's a treaty there amongst the large, the bigger, larger Large underwriters. Right. They say, yeah, okay, if that happens to you, you know, as long as you provide me with that policy, you know, a copy of it, and it's not an exception, you know, we'll cover it. And that, and and that's why you don't have to use the same title insurance company. No, sir. Well, that's good enough. Yeah. All right. Any questions so far? I got a nasty little question. Okay. <laughs> you said it, it's, they're charged by the price of the house or, or the uh, contract. Well, that's like saying, well, a dentist is going to pull my tooth, you know, I got paid more if I drive in a Mercedes than a, than a Volkswagen. You do the same amount of work. For a sixty thousand dollar house or a million dollar house, it's not the work; it's the risk. It's work. If you have a hundred thousand dollar policy versus a three hundred thousand dollar policy, because the value is greater, you have greater coverage. You're paying for the coverage difference. You're only paying for a mistake. <laughs> well, it could go up though. It, could, it, 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 it takes care of any kind of claim up to that policy amount, and the higher price of the home. You may have a larger unreleased lien. The risk is greater. The risk is greater. Well, I knew there was going to be some kind of song and dance thing. Why I was, <laughs> I didn't make why I was wrong and, and <laughs> they're right. Yeah, I, I, I understand. I understand. Right. I understand. It's the risk that's been paid. Okay, the risk. I, but I, I totally agree. Now, with, in regard to insurance policies for the owner, we have a little bit of comparison here of the two types. One is a standard policy, which I would say 95 to 98 percent of the contracts that are used these days, people use the standard policy. There's an enhanced, I call it enhanced, some, some underwriter calls it a homeowner's policy, there's different names for it, but it's, it's, it's enhanced coverage for about 10 percent more of the premium. Now, there's a, there's a comparison here of the, of the standard versus the enhanced of the things that it covers. And it goes along with inflation too, 10% inflation. And I mean, you can see the differences between the two. Now, that's out, thank you. That's out there. And there are only a few contracts that pass our office that have the enhanced policy. I tell people it's out there. There's some title insurance companies and title companies that won't write the standard policy because they feel like, feel like they're doing their customer a disservice by not offering the enhanced policy for just a little bit more money. It's still your decision, it's still negotiable, it's a contract. Just know it's out there and those are the differences between the two of the, of the things that it covers. The standard, of course, has less coverage, the enhanced has more. 
how would I always buy it in hands? Because to me, the cost difference from 10% a little bit more premium for those differences, to me, it's it's absolutely worth it. Just to interject here for a loan officer, if you're talking to somebody and they don't, and you're giving them this option, I would have a copy of this, both sides, and have them sign it. But you gave them that option. You told them about the enhanced. Right. And they'll come back to you and say, well, she just ordered my title for me, and she just got standard, and she didn't tell me anything about it. That's right. And then after the contract signed, here's another thing, too. The buyer may find out about the enhanced policy, but because the contract didn't say that the seller was providing an enhanced policy, then there's who's going to pay that 10, 10% difference? Oh, you think sellers balk at that? Yes, they do. Yeah. They will not do it unless it is in writing on that contract that they'll pay for that enhanced policy. They'll oh, fight yeah. tooth and nail. Yeah. They will. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to be here next Wednesday, too. This is a two-part series. Today is kind of the intro. We've talked about the basics. We're going to talk about, I've got a copy of a, a title commitment, and there's it's some funny stuff on there to, to you know, to liven this up a little bit, because I love title. I think it's fun. But not everybody does, so I have to make it a little bit, a little bit fun for us all. But today is going to be kind of like the basics. What title insurance is, what it's not. Well, how you calculate it, why you need it. We're also going to talk about searches and commitments today a little bit. And then in the final one, we're also going to talk about kind of the during the closing and after when the policy is issued, when to expect it, what it covers, what it looks like, what it does and what it doesn't do. And there's pitfalls to be on the lookout for. We'll talk about that next Wednesday. And also some things that just aren't insurable. There's sometimes things are just not insurable. No matter how creative you get, and I've gotten creative in my day uh, with, with, under the direction of, of our underwriter's guidance just to make sure that everybody's protected. The buyer, the seller, us, the everybody, everybody, the agents, the lenders, everybody's protected. But sometimes you can get a little creative and, and get some things done where other title companies just don't see it. You know, it's just how hard you work. But sometimes you just can't do it. And I'm gonna cook you in to come back to find out what's just it's, it's just not un, it's just uninsurable. A little bit more about today about how the process goes. As you know, this all kind of starts out with a contract or a title order. If it's a refi or a loan or reverse mortgage, it starts out with an order. We set up the file and order the title search. The title search is fire. TIT tells an interesting tale about land in the states. It tells us who owns it, the legal description. It tells us how many mortgages are outstanding. It tells us the tax amount. It tells us if there's a HOA lien, if there's a judgment, if there's a UCC lien. It also gives us a report of what easements are out there, what restricted covenants, class. Uh, charters, master deeds, things like that. It's a report. It's usually three or four pages, and I'll pass that out. I've got you busy today, don't I? I don't think I have, people have to share with that one. Oh, I need to keep one. I just need one. Okay. It's usually a three page report. The first page is just some basic information about the deal who the insureds are, who the lender is, who the buyer is purchase price, loan amount, who owns the property, how they got it, and the legal description. Page two, as you'll see, are the requirements, things that we have to do that we saw on the title. If it's a purchase, a new deed to the owner. If there's a loan involved, it's a loan to the lender. Things that we have to pay off, things that we've got to cure. There's an old lien, as you can see here. There's a, there's a judgment lien, uh-oh. We gotta find out if that's our person or not. Because guess what? People have common names. How many people do you know has common names? The last name of Jones, Smith, or Clark. I mean, you would think about it, you think, well, surely isn't that Ronald Clark? Oh yes, <laughs> there's a bunch of Ronald Clarks, and some of them have liens on them. So we have to do our homework and research to see if that's that same person. Because if it's not the same person, we're not gonna pay it off. We're going, to, we're going to say, okay, that's not them, and we're going to do a not me affidavit. That's not me. That's not my social. That I never lived there. 
this is not me, and we have verified that, like with the plaintiff's attorney. We'll call them and say, need to verify this is them or not. I'll get you paid if it's them, but if it's not, I need verification. So we do confirm that and call and reach out just to make sure. HOA liens, that, uh, those are the things on there. We gotta, we gotta see if they're, if they're legitimate, if they've been paid. Sometimes, if you can imagine, people get paid off and they never release the lien. Now that's just me. Can I ask you something about that one? Yes. I have a home that I'm doing as a short sale, and it went through, it was going through court and I stopped it. The HOA contacted them and said they were going to put a lien on the property. Can they do that and it's going through a short sale? No. Yes, they can. They can. Yes. If they're owed money, HOA has, must have a pretty good lobby at this group because they, they, they are, they're pretty powerful. Okay. They're pretty powerful. They've got a lot of, as what they say on Pirates of the Caribbean, leverage. For two, it's like for 299 bucks. Oh, yeah. They'll put one on there for 10. Okay. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, Power. so the lady, the, the, my client that owns the home, she has to pay that. Or you can pay. Or I pay. Well, I'm doing the short sale loan. It's not mine yet, but don't pass over there. That's what I'm thinking, man. I don't want to finish to sleep till it's mine. Right. But if you know it's there, that's key. Yeah, I know it's there. That's right. You don't want to be blindsided by, you know, and hey, I didn't bargain for this. What do you mean? Mm -hmm. A lot of times I do a lot of short sales. I close, I close deals that are getting short, they're doing the short sale. Right. And a lot of times if there's equity there, this is just what I, I've seen. Mm -hmm. What they'll do is they're like, look, there's enough money there. I'm going to make quite a bit of money. I'll, I'll, I will take that on. Uh, it's two hundred ninety nine dollars or ten bucks or whatever it is, and you kind of have to weigh the risk reward for the whether or not you want to accept it or not. But yes, they're powerful. They they absolutely can. I'm already cutting the grass because. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, there you go. You're good, man. I'm, I'm cutting the grass. Already. Wow. Is it windows? No, I don't do windows. <laughs> Oh, let's see, tax information, how much your taxes are, if they're paid. I'll give you a little hint on what's uninsurable it has to do with property taxes. Let me get to that one. There's certain types of things that can't be insurable in regard to property taxes. Uh, the rest is just some information about the property, the address. Uh, the lenders like endorsements, that's why those are there. You don't get an endorsement on an owner's policy, but lenders like to see what types of endorsements they will issue on the policy. Page three, the things that are not covered, are not covered. On an owner's policy, we do not give coverage for surveys unless we actually see a survey and review the survey and make sure it's good. If we get that survey and it's good and there's no encroachments, there's nothing there that would cause us to have a problem with the survey, we could possibly remove the survey exception at that time. Things that we don't cover, exact acreage to a property. If you have a property that's a meets and bounds description, is this long? You see them? Five tracks. And the title insurance policy, even if the surveyor says it's 5.076925 acreage, that is something that is not, title companies don't, don't do, do not insure that. Do not insure that. That's one thing that's not insurable. Mm -hmm. So all these things, a lot of examples of the things that are just not covered as a standard item for title insurance policies. Flats, restricted covenants, easements, charters, things that are of record, that are there, that run with the land, that go with the land, like the restricted covenants, no feet bucket up mailboxes, no camouflage mailboxes. For example, it is the HOA charter, the restrictions, it just won't be let that happen. So if somebody says, they're filing a lien on me to have that mailbox out there. They're, they're monetarily coming after me because they're going to place they go come out there and remove it. Ooh, no. The violation of the restricted covenants and they've been a record and you knew it when you bought it because, you know, and a lot of times people get copies, the agents get copies for their buyers. Uh, they'll say, hey, I want to, I'm going to see what I can and can't do with that property. 
So you can always ask for that. A lot of times the HOA company, they'll charge for it, but they'll have them readily available, but you have to pay for that up front, but they're there, they're there. So this is a title commitment. All it is is a commitment, just like it says, it's a commitment to insure. It's a commitment that says, look, this who owns it. These are the things that we have to do to write the final policy. Page three are the things that you, it's just, it's an exception to coverage. These are the things that we won't cover. All right, any questions so far about the title commitment? And I, I made some funny ones in there. I do Lover's Lane and Brett Vegas and all kinds of stuff. Yes, sir. Now you heard earlier, we're gonna start getting into tiny homes. Now, tiny homes are not mobile homes, they're not trailers they're with tags on them or anything, they're actual homes. Now, where you can put them on land, you can take them off the land and move them to some other land. Are you, I know this is a new country for you guys, are you gonna, have you thought about anything with these new faggled uh, tiny homes about how to title insure them? That's a good question, because that's the whole issue with mobile homes, is the mobility part of it. Because you're taking part of that collateral that's part of the purchase price, it's part of the loan amount, as using as that is the collateral for borrowing the money, putting the, put the tongue back on it, putting the wheels on it, and taking it off. We covered this ever slow, ever, ever, just a little bit at the last seminar that I had with my underwriter about three weeks ago. And they're making some modifications to their guidelines, and they're not out yet. So that's a great question, and that's something that I'm very anxious to hear how the underwriters will approach that, because if they're affixed to the land and they can't be moved, then, it's, then, well, then that's, that's fine. That's one thing. Right. I mean, there is tiny homes that do that. Well, the mobile homes have tags, like a car tax. When you sell it, you pay your taxes and all that through that. It's so so that, But the other ones are tags like a mobile home. The title part, right. Are. And these are big, some of them are big. I mean, these tiny homes could be a three story building. Right. I mean, they actually move, you know, they fold down and they ship them out. Right. That's a great question. And the title insurance companies um, have started no, uh, seeing the differences, the different ways to structure and to build and the mobility or the not mobility of them. And they're having to take that into account because that's a risk. So they have to look at risk management to see how, hmm, how are we gonna do that? Mark, are they, are they not giving them a VIN number because the intention is to affix them? No, they are. I, I don't think they know what they call them because they're, they're mobile homes. Well, they're not. I mean, they're, 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 well, there's some that are fixed to house. I mean, sure. fixed to the ground, that's one thing. Yeah. But these other ones are, they're, they're supposed to be mobile, but they do not, the only, the only tag they have is for the trailer underneath right. the building. Not for the building itself, which is attached to the trailer. You would think it would be one or the other, but uh, the guy who's the, the owner of the uh, title uh, of the tiny home guy down in Florida, I was uh, uh, meeting with. Uh, the, you do not need a VIN number for the building, uh, only for the trailer. And that's what I'm saying. That at some way, they're going to have to track these things. I mean, they're only, some of them are some of them are only twenty five or thirty five thousand. Some of them are going to be two hundred or three hundred thousand. You said they needed a VIN number. No, they needed the the on the trailer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. on the trailer. When this, but this but there's several the different kinds. Mike, the Mike has a attached to the part of the land, and it is real property. Other than that, it's chattel property. Well, here's the thing. Well, well yeah, but no. You're going to have an affidavit of affixation. That's right. See. Right. So anything that is not essentially site built, stick built, modular manufactured, if it's brought on site in one whole piece, it's a mobile home. Now, now, whether or not it's tagged is a different story. So how about a modular home? A Which modular modular is four pieces. Yeah, and, and I, I think... Four pieces. A modular home is actually like a real property. I've sold a bunch of them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a modular home is not a foundation, and they are tagged. 
Yes, it fits. It fits. It, it, because it's really like a tree. Big, a tree is real property. You cut it down, that's chattel. What's laid there is chattel. Yeah, it's not part of real property anymore. It's so long. <laughs> but as as this evolves, like all these new structures and new opportunities evolve, the underwriters are realizing we have to evolve too to figure out how we protect the lender if there's a loan involved. How do we protect ourselves if they go, well, I can't afford this anymore. Let's put it back on the trailer and let's go somewhere else. That's a problem. There is some insurance companies that insure mobile home. Okay, title is going to be based on the curve. It, it was a in, in the 26 years I've been doing it, there's kind of been a transformation in how we did it too. We used to not do the affixations back years and years ago. We didn't do the affixations, so we had to do very multi-step thing of turning in the title and doing all these documents the state of tennessee and the county clerk's office i mean all kinds of things you had to do and then somebody said okay wait <laughs> let's do this a fixation do away with you know where this title is because a lot of times when you pay off the lien the title just disappears it never goes anywhere not many phone calls i made a vendor but mortgage going Where's the title? I paid you all. I gave you instructions to send it to me. Absolutely. And it didn't, it didn't happen. So. It seems you're releasing the name. That's about it. Well, let me ask a question on a different subject. Uh, I think I know the answer. So you're you're saying that if a, a person is in, and typically we're having a problem in conditions. So we got 10 houses on the street and two houses decide to do Airbnb. So, title insurance will not cover those owners on Airbnb because it's against the CCR. That'd be a problem. Yeah, we so, stopped doing them all together. Yeah. There's some documents in closure packages now that says, I will not convert this property into a BBN. Okay. Wow. Okay. So you're going to have to do a whole other talk on that. New, is that, is that, that, new is that form, just yeah. in Tennessee? Because I know I heard about it. It was trying to stop it. You have to have a high rise condo. Or it has to be a condo, it can't be a single home. There. I don't know about other states. I only do, I, I only do Tennessee. I'm licensed in Tennessee. We have a new thing in that policy that says that. What now? We have a new thing in the policy that states they will not cover it. No, no, I didn't say anything about the policy. <laughs> what did you say? I said there's loan documents from the lender yeah. who's a loan involved. Yeah. yeah. I have them. Not many. Not many lenders have that included in the package, but I've seen them. Yeah. Yeah. Really small letters. Yeah. You know, really but small letters. Yeah. They, they've been doing beach and vacation rentals for eternity. I mean, Airbnb is just an extension of what it's they've different. been doing at the beach for, for years and years. And sometimes you, you had to get different insurance back then. Now that it's become so prevalent, they're cracking down. Mm -hmm. yeah, I've done, done, done weeklies on quads that I had. Yeah. Weekly pay. But you didn't tell anybody, though. Yeah, I was going to say, but you do what you can do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't ask anybody, so I don't know the answer. All right, so if we want to know more, she will have her cards here anytime. Uh, we want to thank you for coming out here. Thank you. Thank you.